thank you all for coming. And it is my pleasure today to introduce our grand round speakers, Dr. Michael Goff. Uh, Michael got his PhD at the University of Leeds and then came over to our neck of the woods and actually did his postdoc training down at Mayo, just down the road in Rochester. He then moved to the Providence Portland Medical Center where he worked with uh, Andrew Weinberg in the area of tumor, tumor immunotherapy and worked on agonistic antibodies to OX40 and then established his own independent research lab and, and really a major sort of recurring theme throughout Michael's work has been understanding how various um, therapies impact the immune microenvironment and then exploiting that knowledge to develop better therapeutic strategies for cancer patients. Um, so his current research is focused on radiation therapy, which I think is, is a really sort of surprisingly understudied area of cancer research, given that uh, many cancer patients are treated with radiation. And given its, given its impact on the immune system, I think lends itself well to, for example, combination immunotherapeutic approaches, which I believe we'll be hearing about today. So um, I've actually known Michael for several years. We've served on study section for many years together. And the great thing about study section is you meet great people with really interesting research. Um, but there's really not enough time to hear about that research. So I thought it would be fun to bring him out and hear more about what he's working on. So thanks for coming out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie. Though, though I, actually, I, I, at study section, her name says Catherine, and so I'm having to transfer my knowledge of what her actual name is. Um, so, so um, yeah, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for uh, being here to, um, uh, that we can have a conversation about our work on uh, radiation immunotherapy. Um, uh, so um, we do have conflict of interest. Um, we do receive some funding from pharma, um, um, but I'm not going to be talking about any of that work here. Um, and so, yeah, we work in Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, this is um, a nice picture of uh, the Columbia River, um, uh, or like a little subsection of it with Mount Hood in the background. Um, and um, uh, I met my wife, I'm from Wales in the UK, I met my wife here down at the Mayo, um, and she's from Portland, and so we compromised and we moved to Portland. Um, and, um, that's why you're still married. That's right, that's right. Um, but it's, it's not actually a very hard sell for someone from Wales, it's actually uh, drier than Wales, so that's a good thing. Okay, so, so we work at Providence, people, most people haven't heard of Providence, but it's actually the third largest cancer, uh, sorry, the third largest hospital network in the country. Um, but it's mostly a set of community hospitals across the western um, coast of the U.S., and not a lot of the centers have research. Um, our hospital, uh, Providence Portland Medical Center, has a research facility uh, headed up by uh, Walter Erber, where we focus on immunotherapy. So everyone in our institute uh, works on immunotherapy of cancer. Um, and then um, the big hospital across the river is uh, OHSU, and so many of us have uh, cross appointments at OHSU and work with... Um, uh, but also collaborate across there. So I guess the hospitals are probably competing, but the research side of things are friends. So I'm going to go through a number of things. Um, this is pretty much an outline we're going to talk about, about some of our preclinical models, about pre-existing immunity. Uh, moving on to some things that I'm actually really excited to talk with you guys about because you know a lot, about, a lot more about resident cells. Um, and then some uh, negative things about um, how, how there are limitations in what radiation can do. Um, so the basic thing, if you've ever been to a talk where someone's talking about radiation and immunotherapy combinations, they're going to have some version of this slide where the idea being that we irradiate a tumor and then we release um, uh, antigens and adjuvant to prime immune responses that come back and control the tumor. Um, as, as I consider myself an immunologist, um, I worked now in radiation for um, uh, over 10 years. My, my wife is a radiation oncologist and immunologist. Before that, though, we worked on um, cytotoxic gene therapy as a means to cause the cell death. So I'm relatively agnostic to radiation as a, as a, as a therapy. The main point is that we can kill cancer cells at a site specifically inside the body of our choosing when we choose, and so it's a really useful model to work with it. But as I was pointing out, uh, half a million people a year get treated with radiation in the country. Um, so there are um, opportunities if it can be manipulated as an immunotherapy. It's, there's, there's, it's an uh, immense um, opportunity to initiate immune responses. And, but as um, immunologists, sometimes there's this assumption that you radiate a tumor and magically you have immune responses. Um, uh, this is the... Um, Equivalent of this, this is uh, Zeus getting cleaved by, his head cleaved by Hephaestus' bronze-bladed axe. 
and out jumps Athena, fully armed. Um, but the reality is that, you know, as an immunologist, that is not what's going on. We are not suddenly irradiating a tumor and s suddenly getting a full forced immune response. Multiple steps need to be uh, to go through in order to get an immune response. And um, the data we're generating recently, we think that actually radiation is relatively defective at generating new responses and mostly works on boosting existing ones. But there are amazing outcomes. This is um, a patient who was on a clinical study at our institute um, who had um, metastatic melanoma, was irradiated to a single lesion in their liver and was given high dose IL-2 and had a complete response. Um, IL-2 alone can do that. Um, uh, so we've just completed a, a randomized uh, phase two clinical study of IL-2 or radiation on IL-2 and we're writing that up right now and it seems that radiation definitely is increasing the outcomes, um, sorry, improving outcomes for patients, increasing cure rates for patients receiving uh, IL-2. So clinically it's working and there's lots of anecdotes coming through now of patients being treated with radiation and checkpoint inhibitors resulting in, in, in control of um, uh, lots of disease. Our models, to model and try and understand how it's working, uh, we used to take mice and put them on the big linear accelerators that patients are treated on, but um, we've now got a small animal irradiation platform that lets us uh, CT scan and use CT guided radiation, of this case a tumor in the flank of the animal, or we've used um, uh, things like uh, contrast agents injected with cancer cells into the pancreas so we can identify tumors and treat more complicated plans. So in theory, we can treat a tumor almost anywhere in the mouse if we can see it. Um, and uh, we don't have to do it on off hours on the big linear accelerators, which is good for us. Um, and some of the models we have uh, are kind of cool. Um, one of the models we've put together is using uh, the, the pancreatic model and, um, where we have spontaneous tumors that uh, PDX, Cre, KRAS, P53. And then we've added in luciferase SIY that's floxed. So this is a mouse whose pancreas is lighting up. Um, you can see a nice uh, signal in the pancreas there. Um, uh, but note these signals too. Um, and, um, um, but so we've made this nice model. We get tumors form in these mice that have uh, luciferase and SIY, but unfortunately these mice are thymically tolerant to SIY, so we weren't quite able to do these tumor studies. So if we, if we give these mice a, um, a uh, listeria vaccination, the normal mice, we get a really strong response to SIY. Um, in the mice that have um, the, the uh, Cree SIY in the pancreas, we don't get a response. The regular listeria antigens respond perfectly well. Um, so uh, unfortunately, they didn't work out uh, to be a, a usable model for, for spontaneous tumor responses, but we can use this for transferring in things like 2C. and. Um, We've also made a series of cell lines from this um, uh, that we can then implant into mice and have luciferase positive tumors and characterized a large number of the inflammatory features and we've got tumors that are more or less EMT to play with. So as we go through the talk, um, I'm gonna be jumping around a lot of cell lines. So feel free if anyone wants to know uh, which cell line we're working with at any particular time um, uh, uh, to just ask. But um, we, we generally do almost everything in multiple cell lines to make sure that, that the things we see are real. And then antigen makes a difference. If we have antigens in this, in a, the, the, a tumor that has antigen in it, a pancreatic tumor, and we give radiation, we get a nice extension of survival. One of the spontaneous lines that doesn't have the added antigen when we transplant it to a mouse do radiation therapy, radiation at almost any dose does pretty much nothing. And so it's very common to find that, for one thing, spontaneous tumor is not very antigenic, but also, um, uh, a big component of what radiation does <coughs> relates to its uh, action on the host own immune system. And so, so a lot of the tumor control in these models by radiation incorporates uh, T cell responses. Okay, so integrating immunotherapy into conventional cancer therapy. The translational questions that we get asked a lot is how much radiation do you give? What fractionation scheme of radiation do you give? How do you time it? These are really, really important questions, but they, they can be really um, dry, really um, like boring scientifically. Um, scientifically, I'm, I'm phrasing essentially the same questions a slightly different way. Um, you're looking at radiation as a way to prime responses or to boost existing ones, following the antigen, following radiation, see where it goes, which cells do the presentation, cross-presentation and priming, um, and, and then looking at all the cellular interactions in the immune environment. So, 
um, while we frame our grants this way, um, these are the experiments that we're actually doing. Okay, and so this is an example of, of that. This is an example of combining radiation and Oxford immunotherapy for um, uh, um, mouse, uh, in this case, CT26 colorectal tumor in BALB-C mice. So uh, we fixed the timing of radiation, and then we gave OX40 at various times, either before, immediately after, or, or later after radiation. And we see synergy, um, we see improved survival um, with the combination of radiation and OX40 only when we give it right after, after radiation. And this makes sense for the biology of OX40. We've worked with OX40 for a long time. It's only upregulated on T cells within about 12 to 72 hours following antigen exposure. So if radiation is releasing antigen into the setup, this timing makes sense. Um, when, when we do the same thing with, um, sorry. Oh yeah, it has changed, okay. There must be another slide. When we do the same thing with uh, CTLA-4, we tested different timings. And um, while both of the post-radiation timings actually were pretty good compared to radiation alone, um, giving CTLA-4 before we gave the radiation was most effective. And we resulted in cures in, in, in almost all the mice we treat with this approach. And that, for us, didn't make any sense initially. Uh, you know, um, we're taking away, in theory, we're taking away a negative and we haven't yet given the positive. Um, and so this actually pointed us to try and look at why the, you know, this biology wanted us to try and understand what was going on and why CTLA-4 was working before radiation. And so as, as um, if you go through the field right now, this is an example of various different um, co-stim or, co or, or, or checkpoint pathways that can exist between T cells and APCs. Pretty much all of these have been tested in combination with radiation and really the data thus far has shown that pretty much all of them work in combination with radiation to improve outcomes. Um, and um, so, so I think there's something very real there in these preclinical models that radiation synergizes with immunotherapies very, very well. But of course the biology should be very different for each of these. Um, an example of understanding what's going on, this is uh, an approach where we gave a vaccine to the mice. Um, in this case it was uh, DEC-205 over an anti-CD40. Um, and we see a nice T cell response. If we give anti-OX40, we boost that response if we give it a day after radiation, uh, day after vaccine. If we give anti-CTLA-4, it doesn't because CTLA-4 isn't co-stimulatory. Um, it it, it um, blocks a negative pathway, so OX40 expands these T cells. If we delay OX40, if we give it a different time point or, or before or, or after, it doesn't work anymore. So um, that confirms that piece, but you know, CTLA-4 still isn't helping T cell responses, antigen-specific T cell responses to the, to the tumor. So again, suggesting that the reason CTLA-4 and radiation are working well together doesn't have a lot to do with making more T cells that can control the tumor. And, and to understand this, we went back to some of the older literature, and um, this is an example from um, before we knew what's about CD4 and CD8 were called, um, the, that uh, Northern Bazooka showed in a series of papers really nicely that following implantation of tumors into mice, there's a T cell response. Um, initially, uh, this lie, one negative, two positive, which are really uh, CD8s, um, this response shows up uh, relatively early, but over time then there's a CD4 response that shows up. And they did a really nice set of experiments showing the ability to transfer these cells and protect against subsequent tumor challenge, and that it was really important to the biology. So while this response is dominant, you could, um, you could be, be protected against a second tumor challenge, or you could transfer these cells and protect. Once these cells show up as well, it suppressed that first effect, and it was you know, some of the early data for, for, for towards Tregs. regs um, So what we think is going on with CTLA-4, it's actually just depleting these, um, these uh, uh, Tregs and allowing the T-cell CD8s that were formed from tumor implantation to do more. Um, and we can see uh, a little bit of that tumor response to implantation. So if we inject these SIY expressing tumors into mice and then look in the peripheral, uh, this in the peripheral circulation, we can see um, SIY pentamer binding cells in the peripheral blood um, by day seven. Uh, we can also see them in the spleen using peptide stimulation. Um, and then they decline in the peripheral circulation over time. And so this is true in uh, cell line PANCO2 SIY we got from um, Chicago. 
Um, with the, also in the spontaneous lines that express SIY, we can see this response, and it, we don't see it in um, in, uh, in in tolerant mice. We've engineered over into the into other cancer cells. It's not just an SIY thing, and we can see an over response, and we don't get it in tolerant mice. Um, and but but broadly in these models, these are poorly immunogenic models. The tumors still grow. The tumor grows relatively the same regardless of whether they have the antigen or not. But of course, we all know there are tumor models that are super immunogenic that just get spontaneously rejected because of this very first immune response in tumor implantation. Um, um, so what we think is going on is, you know, we're putting in such a bolus of cancer cells that there's no way they can all live. There's just not enough vasculature to, and, and food to support them. A certain number of them die, release antigens, and make immune responses. So this looks a lot like what we're trying to do when we irradiate the tumor. Um, and it's limiting our ability, we think, to see what radiation does. Um, also, it affects the response to therapy. So the classic model for checkpoint inhibitors is to give them early, day three, day seven, that kind of timing post-implantation of the tumor. So when we do anti ctla 4 like that, nearly all the mice are cured. But truly, we're giving our therapy before we have a palpable mass. Um, if we give CTLA-4 and if we just wait a little while, wait till day 10 for the first injection, we no longer see any control of these tumors by, by the combination. Um, and this is very common. Almost all of the immunotherapies that we've ever tested that cure mice at day three completely fail once the tumor has fully established itself. We always talked about that as being because later on you've got a more established tumor environment, you've got macrophages, you've got all these other things that might be suppressing that response. But then we started thinking, actually, maybe this is just because we're, they're all being given immediately following a vaccine event, and then that's why they're, they're, they're curing a tumor that never really properly existed. So um, we started uh, trying to take away this immune response at priming so that we could look at the response that radiation gave, um, with the theory that radiation would do all these other things to release material to get immune responses. Um, so again, our model, we can CT mice, we can target tumors. Most of what I'm going to show is tumors in the flank. Um, and so in this experiment, we uh, compared our standard therapy model with depleting CD8 T cells just before we gave, uh, implanted the tumor. And what we see, uh, our combination is extremely effective. We see cures, but if we deplete T cells before we implant the tumor, now radiation, which is at day 14 and CTLA-4 at day 7, no longer works. Um, there are obvious caveats to this, and one of those caveats is that when we looked at the T cell recovery following depletion, that it was a lot slower than we thought it was going to be. Um, the T cells still weren't recovered 14 days um, after implanting the tumor, um, and, and so the CD4s, of course, were unaffected, um, broad myeloid populations were unaffected. So it's perfectly plausible that the reason it wasn't working was this. Um, they didn't have a T cell response recovered at this point. So what we did um, as an alternative is we used FTY 720. Um, many of you are aware of what it is, but essentially one of the things it does is it limits lymphocyte recirculation, particularly holding lymphocytes in, um, in secondary lymphoid organs. And so if we give this a day, a single dose, a day before we implant the tumor, we get a transient hold on lymphocytes from peripheral circulation, um, not monocytic populations, and it recovers very, very quickly. So we tested giving FTY 720 right before implanting the tumor or right before delivering the radiation. And what we found is if we did it right before radiation, it worked perfectly well. We still got cures. But if we did it right before implanting the tumor, um, the therapy didn't work. So um, all of the cure we got from our tumors was dependent on something that happened right back here. And it's not just true for CTLA-4. We did the same thing with PD-1. Uh, cures with most of the mice with a combination, and then with FTY-720 given at implantation, we, get, um, um, uh, we lost the effect. Um, FTY-720 didn't actually completely block the T-cell response. We still got a response in the draining lymph node, and then when they got released, we could see circulating cells. It's just at a, at a, a significantly lower level. So we, we went to the literature, and um, we used CD40 ligand blockade. Um, this has been used in the transplantation literature. Um, to It will allow allografts to take, uh, partial allografts to take, and particularly if you combine it with anti ctla 4 you can... Uh, anti ctla 4 agonists, you can actually get full, allogra full allografts to take. Um, 
And so the standard thing that people would do when they're transplanting pieces of skin was to give anti-CD40 ligand, this MR1 antibody, at day 0, 1, and 2. So we did that in day 0, 1, and 2 of tumor implantation. They completely blocked the T-cell response. Um, it's a little crushed up at the end here. Um, it's not significantly different from mice that were tolerant to the antigen, um, there's, but there, there's, there's a hint that there's, there are a few cells around. If we wait, we haven't depleted the T-cells, because if we wait a couple of weeks and then implant the tumor after the CD40 ligand, we again get a T-cell response. So the, presumably the precursors are still around, they just couldn't um, respond. And so now if we give anti cd 4 uh, if, if we do the anti cd 40 ligand at implantation again, we block the ability to make immune responses. So um, what we're seeing is that using a variety of different techniques, it seems to us that the immune response we got when we implanted the tumor into the animal, this the artifact of animal tumor models, is completely describing the, the, the generating the cells that, that, that cure the mice. Um, Oh, that's CT26. This is the same thing in, in PANCO2 SIY. Okay, so, uh, and then, then there's these, um, I love these, these wobbles, these different um, variant responses. For me, there's hope. There, there's the possibility of generating new responses, um, and, and uh, you know, we'll come into a little bit of that. And then, um, I guess this is more of a technical thing if there's radiation people in here, but um, there's a big debate about how the optimum way of doing radiation. We were given single large doses of 20 gray because that was, uh, that's convenient for us in terms of asking timing questions. There's arguments that um, a fractionated dose of, of slightly lower uh, radiation is more effective. Um, immunologically, um, a, a, the biological equivalent dose of four doses of eight gray is equivalent to one dose of 20 gray because of the way radiobiology works. But we also see the tumor control by this therapy is also blocked by uh, blocking implant, uh, tumor responses at implantation. So, so uh, but it seems to us that across the board, um, this is how things are working. Okay, so um, summarize this little piece that we think that tumor cure by the therapies we're given right now, depending on pre-existing immunity, generated as an artifact of tumor implantation. Mm -hmm. So this has clear implications for patients. If the patients don't have a pre-existing immune response to their tumor, then we, this approach shouldn't work. Um, so then it becomes a question of how common is that? Um, uh, I worked with Andy Weinberg, and his view is that everyone has a response. They just need to be stimulated appropriately. Um, but I'm a little more pessimistic than that. Um, so then how does pre-existing immunity impact the tumor? What does the tumor environment look like with this pre-existing uh, pre immunity blocked? Um, one of the things we thought was going to be there was cytokines, and I'm not going to show data on that, but essentially the cytokine environment as done by multiplex bead assay was identical. So there was no evidence that there was a different cytokine balance in these untreated tumors with or without pre-existing immunity. We looked at T-cells. As I said, the T-cells pretty much leave the circulation over time if you follow the control animals. Um, they're down to the background level of detection we can see with anti-CD40 ligand. Tumors are the same size. There is a decrease in CD8s in the tumor, um, but roughly the proportion of those that are antigen specific, specific stays about the same. So the pentama, SRI pentama positive, um, is about the same. Uh, variation takes away the significance here. Um, we, uh, um, Amy Moran, um, who trained with Kristen, yeah, uh, uh, we were lucky enough to have Amy come and work in Andy's lab, and so we collaborated with her to use the, uh, the NER model to try and look for antigen recognition in the tumor environment. Um, and, um, and so uh, if we gate on the SIY pentamer reactive cells in the tumor, uh, look in a NER negative mice or a NER positive mice, we can see a proportion of these cells are reacting to uh, antigen as far as we can tell. Um, if we look at what happens with anti-CD40 ligand, again, we get this decrease in, in CD8s. Again, the percentage of those that are uh, SIY about the same but the percentage that are recognized in antigen was about the same as well. So although we, we say we got rid of pre-existing immunity, now we find there are T cells in this tumor in equivalent quantities apparently seeing antigen at equivalent amounts. So now it's not making any sense anymore. But um, Andy Weinberg and, and uh, um, Rebecca and Thomas Duan were working on an approach to identify antigen-specific cells in patients. And they uh, found that this CD39, CD103 positive population represented a, a, a strong antigen reactive population. And um, Tiffany was looking at dendritic cells in the tumor and was, had CD103 in there, so we started looking and we found that uh, we also saw 
the strong CD103 positive population enriched in the antigen reactive cells. And if we, uh, if we look at these in the NER model, um, if it's a little complicated slide, but if we look at the antigen reactive versus the SAY non antigen reactive that presumably contain other antigen reactive cells, but we just don't know what they are. Within this, we can see a 103 positive population and a 39 positive population within the 103 positives. And if we look at NER positivity, in, uh, the, the, as we go towards the 103, 39 positive, we get more and more of them being um, NER positive. So this is moving up towards, this is the dual positive 103, 39. And then in the antigen, uh, we don't know what they react with population, NER is much lower. But um, if we do it by MFI, we start to see in the 103-39 positive, we start to see a higher MFI population showing up. So we think that we, we're looking at um, an enrichment for antigen reactivity with this population. So if we do anti-CD40 depletion, uh, we're back to a, a different model that has slightly lower baseline numbers now, but within the SIY positive cells, we see this 103 positive population and it's uh, completely abrogated if we do anti-CD40 lag under implantation. And so that's within the SOI positive um, and also uh, within the SOI negative. We lose <coughs> this 103 positive population in the tumor environment. Um, and so what we, th what we think is going on, and we don't know the biology of this yet, and um, I'm really excited to talk to people today to help us understand what's going on, that when we implant the tumor, we're generating a, a population that becomes tumor resident and, um, and that massively impacts the consequence to, the, to, to, to what happens with therapy. And so in some way, this, this, this population is pretty much the only thing we can find that's different between these tumors, uh, and the, but that correlates with outcome. And this makes us look at the literature slightly differently about pre-existing immunity and outcome. So, you know, for Decades, people have been correlating T cell responses in tumors with improved outcomes in patients, and uh, imaging methods have got a little better, so now we're starting to get large scale automated analysis. These are some of our patients with pancreatic cancer, and we find patients with more T cells in their tumor do better than those who have lower T cells in their tumor across, <coughs> across whatever treatment they got. Um, but then, Andy, in his paper, identified this within the a signature within these guys and found that um, people with head and neck cancer who had more of these CD39-103 cells did very well with conventional therapy compared to those who had uh, few of them. And you know, broadly, head and neck cancer has quite good outcomes in this particular kind of cohort, um, but you can see there's a very big differentiation between uh, those patients. So um, it seems that, that the presence of resident populations in the tumor with this particular phenotype very, very strongly influences the outcome of treatment. Okay, so to summarize this piece, um, what we see is that implantation causes a particular set of antigen-specific cells to show up in tumor that correlates with outcome. But as you see, we don't really have proof yet that these cells are, are, um, uh, are, are, are causing the events. There's just a correlation right now. Um, and we don't know the mechanism um, either. Um, and so we, we did ask questions about if, if, if o these are the only antigen-specific cells in, in the animal and, um, and what happens with the treatment. Um, and because what we see is if we look at the, uh, we give mice a treatment, um, PANCO2 SRY, then we give radiation and PD-1. If we look at day seven, in the animals that got um, the tumor implanted, all of the mice had some kind of a T cell response detectable. So then we wait, we give our treatment, and then we look again seven days after, um, after radiation. Um, the mice that got no treatment, um, they look pretty much the same as the mice that are completely tolerant to the animal. There's no evidence the T cells are around. But the mice that got radiation and PD-1, we can now see a circulating population of antigen-specific cells generated by treatment. So we wanted to know whether these cells were the same as these cells. Um, or have we just boosted an existing population? So the only way we could think of really telling if they're the same cells was to do uh, some TCR sequencing. Okay. So um, if you look at the top, what we first did is we used a Listeria model to get a lot of T cells. Um, we gave mice uh, Listeria Express and SIY. Seven days later, we sorted um, cells from the peripheral blood of, of mice. 
and then um, uh, gave the mice a second boost at day 21 and again sorted cells from peripheral blood. So these mice were kept alive. It's the same mice that we sorted at day 7 and day 21. Um, and um, then we did TCR-seq and they're just the pentamer positive cells. So we already know these are all antigen specific. Um, so um, one of the things that was immediately obvious to us when we did this analysis is that although we're sorting, sorting pentamer positive cells from mice, the, the three different mice had different profile of TCR sequences. Um, so there was very little overlap between these cells, so these mice. So we, could, we had to look at the same mice before and after. We couldn't just pool these guys. But if we looked at prime and boost sequences, we found that the sequences of boost and prime, pretty much half of the population we were pulling out at boost was shared with the prime. And given our very small sample size from 100 microliters of blood, we think that essentially um, you know, there's a very good overlap. It's the same cells we're boosting that are the ones that we primed. So when we did this with tumors, though, we did that radiation PD-1, so the day 7 cells and the day 21 cells that we see following radiation and PD-1. Again, no overlap between the mice, fewer clones, fewer cells. We saw almost no overlap between these. So it seems to us that the cells we're generating from treatment actually aren't the ones that we initially primed to. So we looked in the tumor environment. We just sequenced the tumor with no sorting, just every cell that's in there, TCR-seq with the, well, the DNA, and then did TCR-seq. Um, what we found was um, uh, we're now overlaying the tumor with the um, implantation clones and the therapy clones. Uh, not a huge amount of overlap, but obviously most of the clones are not the same because they're of unknown specificity. So if we just look at the top 20 most frequent clones in the tumor um, um, and then match them up with the pretreatment and post-treatment, um, you see that some of the two, definitely the, the clones that we could find pretreatment are found in the top 20 in the tumor, uh, as are some of those clones that we fo see following treatment. In red are the ones that, uh, the, the few that were in both situations. And then unfortunately this animal had so few clones that we weren't able to match them up very well. But the point being that the, the, this, the clones that we generated at implantation are found in the tumor. They're just not found in the circulation post-treatment. So it suggests to us that we are, when everything is in place, the, the tumor, the, the, we are making new immune responses post-treatment uh, that they're circulating and doing things. We just don't know quite um, how implantation immunity is, is affecting that. And so that's what we're trying to figure out right now. Okay. Um, there are, so yeah, basically there are cells distinct from those generated in implantation. Are there, are, there, are there still circulating cells just below our detection? We've, um, I'm going to summarize these experiments rather than show them. We've been looking to see if we have uh, residual circulating immune cells that are just below detection, and essentially, yes. We, we, it's not every angina reactive cell is in the tumor. There still are plenty of circulating cells that we can expand through vaccination or through or just enough to actually prevent growth of a concomitant tumor. So although there's this massive enrichment in the tumor, there still are circulating cells out there. Okay, so, so to summarize this section, um, uh, we get a response in implantation. Most therapies fail early, uh, work early and fail later, uh, but the radiation reinvigorates things, but it's, it's very much dependent on the immune response to implantation in our models. So we think this has implications for patients who have better or worse immune responses. Um, and so what we really need is a way, we feel, to regenerate this population in tumors that lack them. And, and we're, we're, we're working on that, and so far we're not succeeding. Um, so if we then rethink how radiation as a means to make new immune responses, um, uh, you know, we're going back and starting to uh, follow the antigen to try and understand how this works. So um, the principle being, you know, as I showed earlier, in theory we kill cancer cells, and that material can go to various phagocytic cells in the environment. And ideally, we want to get it into the nice cross-presenting DCs that can go off to lymph nodes and initiate new immune responses. Um, but there's abundant populations of phagocytic cells, particularly macrophages in the tumor, that not, are not capable of cross-presentation and um, are, in fact, very capable of suppression. And if you actually look at the numbers, there's far more of these macrophages than there are DCs. And so the tendency is for cell death to not go to DCs in particularly large quantities uh, compared to macrophages. Um, and 
And we've been following um, which DCs matter using the literature. Um, I think uh, Tiffany used a particular phenotype and pop phenotyping here that was um, based on uh, Crummel's lab, identifying in the draining lymph node of a growing tumor um, uh, various DC populations, the migratory 103s, resident CD8, migratory 11B, resident 11B, all DC subsets. Um, and so if you pulse any of these, you sort them out from draining lymph nodes and then pulse them with peptide. All of them are very good at making T cell responses. If you pulse them with hool over and then put OT1 on them, um, only these two populations are capable of making T cell responses. So these are the ones with the capacity to cross present. Um, but then if you look at the ones, you don't pulse them with anything and put them, uh, this is an SOI expressing tumor, so you put them with uh, 2C, um, you find that only the migratory 103 actually has any antigen on the surface endogenously. And so this fits with uh, the, the data that there's uh, certain subsets of DCs that migrate from the tumor to draining lymph node, bring in antigen with them. So we've been looking at what happens for in radiation to these populations. And uh, initially, we were, to our surprise, we were finding less uh, efficient antigen presentation by these cells in the draining lymph node for in radiation in our PANCA 2 siy model. So Tiffany then... Um, this was a surprise. Tiffany then looked at a, a range of other cell lines to follow this up. And if we look in the tumor at, at uh, CD103 positive DCs um, after radiation, in, in, in a range of models, we actually see a decrease in these DCs. And you know, we think, okay, they've decreased in the tumor and they've moved off the lymph node. They're not especially radiosensitive when we make them in vitro, so we don't think it's just death of the DCs, though we haven't proven that yet. Um, but when we look in the draining lymph node, um, some models you see an increase in DCs, and other models we don't. Um, and interestingly, MC38 and Mach1 are highly responsive to immunotherapies, including radiation combinations. Mach2, and this is uh, one of our pancreatic lines, uh, very, very poorly responsive to radiation and immunotherapy combinations. And so far, as we look across tumor models, we're finding that um, DCs fail to track to lymph nodes in poorly immunogenic tumor models. Um, and so what we think is there's something going on in the tumor immune environment that's stopping that process. And we keep coming back to macrophages. Um, and this is particularly relevant in the context of something like radiation that causes widespread cell death. We see one to two log death of cancer cells post-radiation within a few days um, if we do you know, try and regrow them out of the tumor. The tumor itself stays about the same t size in that period, so there's a lot of other infiltrating cells coming in, and the stroma remains intact, and um, one of the things that's early recruited is macrophages, and we've known for a long time uh, that if you combine uh, irradiated or dying cells with macrophages, they can produce a whole bunch of negative inflammatory cytokines. And now, I know a lot of people don't like it, but it's convenient to talk about M1, M2 polarization, and, and it, it's, it's very clear that interaction with apoptotic cells can push macrophages to this suppressive M2 phenotype. Um, and so we think that one of the large-scale events that's happening in a tumor post-radiation is interaction with macrophages, with these dying cells, that triggers an intrinsic wound repair phenotype. Um, different tumors have different propensities to go in that direction according to the inflammatory environment, and, and, but if, if you get a really strong wound repair phenotype, you get very poor cross-presentation and T-cell control of the residual disease. So this is an example of pancreatic tumor in mice that we've irradiated. Post-radiation, you can see a, the, a pretty much a loss of cancer cells, but this thickening stroma, and within the stroma you see a lot of F480 positive macrophages, and we've sorted these macrophages out of uh, untreated or treated over time, and we see an accumulation of a range of markers that you associate with M2 macrophages, so arginase and things like that. Um, and so we think that the, the radiation is directly, as well as having positive effects in theory, at causing antigen release, et cetera, et cetera, is, um, is driving a negative uh, suppressive response in the tumor environment, and those things are then going to war, and the relative balance of that influences outcome. So we were looking for the drivers in macrophages that could explain this behavior. We saw that um, um, a gene called MERTK was increased in tumor-associated macrophages post-radiation, and MERTK is part of a family, TAM family, they call it, which is Tyro-3, Axel, and MER. 
that are involved in recognition of, of dying cells and, and phagocytic pro process. Um, uh, and they're linked by GAS6. Uh, it's a, it's a um, protein S family member that's in the part of the clotting cascade, in fact. But it, it bridges phosphatidylserine on dying cells to MERTK <coughs> and then signals through MERTK and phagocytosis is part of that. That being said, there are a lot of other things that can be involved in phagocytic uptake of cancer cells. Um, you know, uh, uh, MFG8 and integrins um, and um, protein, uh, sorry, C1Q. There's a lot of different components that can be involved in uptake of apoptotic cells. But MERTK, for one thing, is a signaling receptor that a lot of those things, other ones, aren't. Um, but also MERTK is highly specific to macrophages, according to a series of studies. It's been described on dendritic cell populations, but um, this is using the ImGen data set, and you see um, it enriches very much in macrophage populations. And in fact, in analysis of the ImGen data set, uh, the, the, the group published a paper saying that it was one of the most macrophage-specific genes. So we thought this is an awesome target to intervene on. If you trigger MERTK um, with GAS6, you can change the phenotype of macrophages in terms of their response to LPS. So if you give them, um, GAS6, you can actually just see VEGF go up, but also, um, um, also it limits their ability to produce um, in IL-12 on, on um, LPS stimulation. And it, it, so it also, you would see pretty much the same pattern for um, um, GAS6 will tend to drive a macrophage, make an IL-10 response following LPS stimulation instead of a TNF response. Um, and we've done a num uh, number of experiments, and we think that what's going on, it's changing the, um, the, the NF-kappa B signaling in these cells. Because it's not actually changing their phenotype by classic M1 uh, or M2 markers. If we, the classic thing to make an M2, M1 is to give interferon gamma and LPS, and you get INOS, and give IL-4, and you get arginase, you give GAS-6, and you don't get either of those, but you do get this cytokine shift. So it seems to be changing the signaling inside the macrophages, but not obviously changing their, their differentiation. Um, but if we then, um, uh, we made, uh, we got from Jackson back across the BALB-C and we made um, BALB-C lacking MERTK and then give these radiation therapy, no other immunotherapy, we see um, that um, most of the mice now are cured if the macrophages lack MERTK. So we could convert the tumor environment just through a loss of this one gene in the host. Um, and this works across a range of doses. So um, if we look at the wild type mice, in a range of doses, we see um, moderate extension survival, but we rapidly see long-term survival with the MERTK knockout mice. Um, so MERTK is one approach to, 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 to basically to look at various different things that are driving this suppressive response in macrophages following radiation-induced cell death. Um, to try and what we think is going on, it's allowing antigen to get to DCs, but also not generating the negative environment that would suppress their ability to traffic. Um, and then the other piece is push um, towards more like an M1 response. And so to put things into the tumor that's going to flip the immune environment. One of those things we've worked with is uh, sting ligands. Um, we tested a bunch of different things and sting was by far and away the most potent. Um, so a few years ago, we uh, published this guy in collaboration with Aduro. They gave us their uh, CDG, and if we injected this into the tumor right after radiation, we saw very rapid um, um, regression of the tumor through mostly uh, an innate TNF-driven hemorrhagic necrosis event. If we combined it with radiation, almost all the mice are cured at this particular dose. Um, but, you know, you can play with the dose, and sting ligands alone can be very, very effective. But radiation <coughs> caused for us synergy in controlling the primary tumor, but also um, uh, we started to see peripheral T cells that were able to impact distant tumors. Um, so, so what we think is going on um, in, in, in poorly immunogenic models is this is a defect in DC, DC trafficking post-radiation, um, and that our bias is that macrophages are going to explain this, um, uh, but we're going to get there at some point. Um, I don't know the proportion of macrophage people in the audience. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes I've shown images of macrophages or what I thought of macrophages that we've sorted out of tumors on the screen, and then DC people have said, well, that's a dendritic cell, and macrophage said, well, that's a macrophage. So <laughs> I think um, I often um, just say myeloid 
to avoid, uh, to avoid <laughs> arguments. In the same way that I tried to stop saying apoptosis and necrosis a while back, and I just called it cell death, uh, because uh, pe people get very upset if, 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 um, according to their, their work. Um, so um, so what, what we haven't yet done, and because these, these experiments are not presented in the order in which we did them, is I don't yet know whether MIR-TK and STIM ligands and these things are actually generating new immune responses. We have not gone through all of our experiments and redone them with anti-CD40 liganded implantation, but piece by piece we're doing those experiments. <coughs> so I don't yet know that these are truly new responses. It's perfectly possible that everything I'm showing is still boosting of pre-existing immunity and none of them are successfully generating new immune responses. So that remains to be determined. Um, but the story, the thing that I would really like to, to communicate from, from the presentation is that checkpoint inhibitors really do work, absolutely, no, no, no argument that, but, but they support the function of pre-existing immune responses, and that makes sense in terms of their biology. They're only on existing activated T cells. Um, our standard mouse models, the treatment models that we're using to test radiation and various other therapies, um, Tumor implantation generates a T-cell response that's really, really important to everything we see afterwards. Um, uh, so this is a genuine limitation in mouse models, implantation models of cancer. Uh, that being said, it's still the most efficient way of rapidly testing immunotherapies in a whole animal. And so long as we understand this caveat, I think uh, there's nothing wrong with us carrying on doing mouse tumor models, uh, just that I think we need to appreciate this caveat. Um, and then, really, to generate new immune responses, we need to just follow the standard paths of immunology. Um, we can't expect immune responses to pop out foreign radiation. Certain things have to happen. DCs have to go to a lymph node and meet a naive T cell for anything to go on. If that's not happening, then, then um, we can't expect uh, radiation to generate new immune responses. And I think that uh, because we're able to look mostly at boosting, we can get away with not looking at um, the interaction between cross-presenting DCs and, and, uh, and, and CD8s. So um, lots of people uh, effort went into this. I've um, got in italics the various people in the lab whose experiments I've shown up on here. Uh, Terry joined the lab more recently and, and Garth also. Um, um, all of this is done in collaboration with uh, Marka, um, um, co-investigator in the lab. Uh, she's a, a radiation oncologist, and she's also my wife. Um, and so, um, and she's the smart one in the relationship as well. So, um, and these former members who've moved on, uh, David's actually down in grad school at the Mayo, and Tori's across in med school at um, um, uh, in um, Iowa. And Christina and Pepper have gone on to form their own labs. So, and then lots of collaborators within here, and of course, um, Amy, who's now got her own, own spot over at OHSU, um, uh, worked with us on the, on the NER model. And uh, the uh, work is supported by um, R01s for myself and Marka, and, and, and there's also some stuff in here from an, an R03. Uh, thank you all very, very much for your time. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a picture of some of the people, and, uh, and um, we actually are hiring faculty, so <laughs> <laughs> just I'll leave that up when we talk. So have you tried the anti-CSF1 receptor approach yet for targeting the microphages? Yeah, so uh, from here, we, we have been using anti-CSF1. Yes, so we had a collaboration with BMS uh, to work on the anti-CSF1R. Um, uh, so it works in that it depletes macrophages, but it, for us in the pancreatic models, it had a very moderate effect on tumor growth and um, not a lot of synergy with radiation. And this fits with the literature, the people who have done macrophage depletion with radiation, you see a slowing of growth, but not really cures. Um, and my bias is that I would much rather repolarize a macrophage than I would take it away. Um, so I think that they're contributing a positive element there too. Sorry. I'm not personally acquainted with the CD103 slash 39 cell. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the properties of that cell? Sure, sure. Um, so for that, I lean a lot on, on Andy's work. Um, he's done much more characterization of these cells. Um, so 103 being um, um, something that binds to Egoderin might allow close association with epithelial cells. 39 uh, being involved in adenosine metabolism. Um, 
It, 39 broadly is just an activation marker. It's, it, there are quite a lot of cells that can activate CD39 um, in the tumor environment. Tregs have a lot of it, for example. So Andy has seen that these cells in patients enrich for, uh, enrich for KLF2. Um, they have increased, uh, in patients, they have increased CD69, and they have, um, but they also, and they also have increased Key67, but they have decreased, um, uh, I, th I know also they also have a lot of the checkpoint regulators. They have a lot of uh, CTLA-4 and things on the surface and PD-1 on the surface. So they look, they look like exhausted cells. And the, 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 again, the word I'm avoiding saying is that they're T-resident memory. Uh, they probably are, but uh, um, uh, I, I don't think they've done the experiments to overlap those data sets to say that these are t resident memory, but they enrich for that population. But they're not killer cells? They don't kill very well, okay. um, and they don't proliferate ex vivo very well. So um, what, you, what Andy found was he takes these cells out and give them the standard approach of taking a patient's tumor, chopping it up into pieces and giving lots of IL-2. They don't proliferate out of that very well. They have to play with that in order to get those cells to, to grow. Um, they've got an approach, I think, to make them grow now, but um, I, I, I would, I'm not hiding it. I just can't remember what it is. Um, but yeah, they, they are not especially proliferative, and they're not showing signs of being directly cytotoxic unless they fire them up first. Um, Mm. long term. And I'm just wondering, do the mice in your model experience that? Right, yeah. So, so yeah, that's a, a, yes. Well, so, so here's the thing. We, we rarely get them alive that long. Um, um, so, um, but when we were using the clinical linear accelerators, um, the way we would be able to do this experiment is to put the tumor in the limb of the animal. And, and then, so that you can extend the limb inside the beam. Um, and when we did that, the long-term survivors had a tendency to get fibrosis in the joints of that leg. And they also, they would get toxicities of, um, uh, they get what we call uh, moist desquamation. So the skin, particularly on the exit dose on the other side of the leg, um, would get, um, would get uh, wet because they would be killing the, the, the stem cells in the skin and then over time it would repair. So patients see that too. If, if if you're using older school approaches that give a high skin dose. Um, but I guess my question was, do you think that like mer inhibition, which is just a really attractive idea, but is that gonna impair the tissue repair response, do you think? Yes. Um, so so uh, we, in the, 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 in the, just the mer knockout mice, we saw no real consequence with radiation, but with the bowel seed. But when we did it with some of the pancreatic models, um, we didn't see extension survival in mer knockout mice, but we'd already done some work using radiation and TGF beta inhibition. So we did a combination, and if we did TGF beta <coughs> inhibition plus mer knockout, we saw cure of pancreatic tumors in 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 black six mice. But we also saw then much enhanced toxicity at the treatment site. So absolutely, I think we're playing with the the wound repair process here, and and so when you generate a wound, we're we're, we're it bears an issue there. So, um, yeah. So, so the, the, uh, yeah, I think that the, the issue with mer knockout is they never have mer. Yeah, so um, if we can find an intervention and we're trying to figure out intervention approaches that make this work without having to be gone forever, uh, we think we can skip some of the toxicity events. But yeah, that's gonna be a problem. Speaking on, on TK, another thing that that does is to limit the type 1 interferon response. And uh, you were also showing a positive effect in stimulating the sting, which is interferon. Do you think that's playing a role in this reprogramming of uh, myelotelling? Right, yeah, so it's possible that the MERTK is not so much doing anything all as much as it is permitting the other things to go on. Yeah, um, we don't know yet. Um, we're. we're um, it, it's one of those things where there's various projects in the lab that are all kind of coming to the same place at the same time. And so we're trying to figure out now exactly that question, if mer inhibition is causing an, an increased interferon response and how that affects DCs. Um, but if we look through, if we look through the, the um, online data sets of patients who have um, responses to radio, uh, sorry, uh, have the more mer TK you have in the tumor, 
the, the, um, we see a switch from NF kappa B P fifty to uh, NF kappa B P fifty P sixty five heterodimers to homodimers, and then poor outcome, and that's involved with both suppression of, of TNF and interferon signaling, so it can block IRF induction, and driving IL-10 and VEGF production. And so we think that the MER is a good candidate for, for something that drives macrophages to have this repolarized response to the same stimuli. So still uh, TLR or whatever stimuli can have a completely different response by chronically activating MER. Um, and that very much changes outcome. But MER is definitely not the only thing that can drive this chronic ERK activation that causes P50 accumulation. So um, um, very interesting to talk about things like LIN and SICK, whether those are driving similar, similar responses in tumor-associated macrophages. Okay, thank you very much.